Hello, and welcome to an adventure. Uh, I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and hopefully you can see and hear me. Um, <laughs> not that there are any particular issues today, just that there was a lot of additional setup because um, if you're watching and you were not already aware, there was a, um, a breach of some data at Twitch, uh, and it is a, an excellent idea for you to uh, go and change your passwords and enable two-factor authentication. So we already had two-factor authentication turned on here on both accounts that I'm streaming to, um, but changing the passwords necessitates changing the stream key, which just necessitates extra steps in, in getting the stream set up for the day. So uh, that's all been done on this end. Hopefully you're taking care of yourself and keeping yourself safe as well. Uh, welcome Hannah, welcome Simsilica, and welcome Fluid N. Thank you for confirming that you can see uh, me and um, I assume that that also means you can hear me. <clears throat> At the top of the uh, Archival Adventures stream every week, I do like to read the Land and Labor Acknowledgement uh, from Virginia Tech uh, since this stream is at Virginia Tech and it's something that I do as an employee of Virginia Tech using Virginia Tech materials, I think it's important to pay attention to what they're saying about um, <clears throat> land and labor, uh, which you'll hear in just a minute. Um, I also think it's really important that they updated this very recently. Uh, so, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their land and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from the lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Ode Prosim that I may serve in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence. We commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So I think it's really important to read that at the top of this every week. I also, um, my job particularly involves working with both the indigenous community and the black community. Uh, so uh, I think it's important that we not just recognize that they've updated the language, but that we try to hold them accountable to what they say um, and for actually doing better. So, <laughs> thank you. Oh, hello. Hello, 16-bit Eric. Hello, Whimsies. Um, welcome to Archival Adventures. Uh, and Melba, thank you for the 100 spooky bits. Um, if this is your first time here, uh, this is a stream that I do weekly on both the twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios channel and twitch.tv slash Rogan27 channel. Um, and it is a stream where I share materials from the archives and special collections at Virginia Tech. Um, so I am the community collections archivist here at Virginia Tech and I work with um, historically marginalized communities to try and make sure that their information is part of the historical record. Um, but I also do community outreach on behalf of the archives, and this show is part of that. Uh, kind of just sharing what we have and breaking down the barriers, because so many people think archives and special collections, and they think, don't touch. <laughs> and so I'm here kind of to invite you all in. Um, I am a professional archivist. I've been an archivist for six years after getting my Master of Library and Information Science. Uh, and. I felt the same way before I started moving into archives. I was like, oh, these are, you know, super valuable things that, that people aren't allowed to touch. And this show is partly like, yeah, I'm the expert. I'm, I'm here and I know about archives. I don't know everything that's in our archives. Nobody does. 
Um, so I get to explore what we have alongside you, and you get to watch me explore what we have in our archives. Um, I think it's fun, and hopefully you do as well. So anyway, this week is, this is the first Wednesday in October. And so I thought I would look through our archives and see what kinds of spooky and scary things I could find. Um, I haven't pulled everything. I know we've got some cookbooks that I may pull out later in the month. But I do have items from our rare books collection that are uh, scary stories. I have items from our pulp fiction collection, um, pulp uh, ma like magazine collection uh, that are like, oh, what are they called? Magazine of Horror and Magazine of Horror and Strange Stories and Uncanny Tales, Sinister Stories. So I thought those would be fun and interesting to look at. I also pulled two folders from our uh, vertical files, which if you're not familiar with the terminology, vertical files are like newspaper clippings, brochures, ticket stubs, anything that essentially would be ephemera um, on a specific topic that has been collected over the years and put into a folder. So ephemera are things that uh, were created with the intention that they would not be retained. So uh, newspapers, it's expected that you're going to throw them away. Uh, ticket stubs, p event flyers, event posters. Those are things that people aren't expected to keep. Um, and those are the kinds of ephemera that we, we collect for vertical files. These are, uh, there's a vertical file here for Montgomery County, Virginia called Ghosts and Folklore and one for Southwest Virginia called Ghosts and Folklore. And so I thought we would start there. <clears throat> also, how is everybody doing? Uh, I hope that you're all having a good day. I know that we've all had some, uh, some hiccups on the Twitch platform today with just having to remember your password so you could go in and change it. Um, by the way, if you haven't done so, change your password. Uh, let me switch to the document view here for you. <laughs> and. Let's take a look at some of these ghosts and folklore items. Uh, I'm going to start with Montgomery County, which is extremely local. That's the county that um, Virginia Tech sits in. And let's just see what, what we have for ghosts and folklore in this vertical file. I have no idea. I pulled the folder, and I have not, not yet looked in the folder. So you're going to experience this in uh, real time with me. <laughs> you laughed when Twitch told you to update your password after you'd already changed it. Yes. Well, and so <clears throat> I was slightly annoyed because I changed my Twitch password last week. And then I had to change it again today. <laughs> so I hadn't even had time to learn the other one. Um, not that I learn my passwords anymore. All right, let's, let's see what this newspaper article has to say about local folklore of ghosts and goblins. This is a newspaper article from April 25th of 1982 the newspaper is marked as NM, and I am not familiar with that newspaper. News Messenger, I think it might be. Um, if my mods are here, they might know. Uh, yes, it is the Montgomery County News Messenger. An area of great interest to us at Richard Montgomery Foundation is the impact of the black culture on the development of folklore and customs in the Appalachian District. Two of our associates are working on projects now. This is, I, I will note that the terminology in here and the phrasing of how this, these sentences are written may not reflect how we would write them today. 
Uh, but again, this is a historic document from 1982. The black and white cultures developed along separate lines, rarely crossing and generally touching only in business. Many of the traditions and values of the black people of Montgomery County grew out of the slave experience. The impact of this experience is still with us today, but most generally in folklore. The superstitions and beliefs of the slaves arose from tribal experiences in Africa and from a very real need to provide services to the black population in a time when such services could not be obtained from the white segment. The very prominent area of this need uh, surrounded the practice of medicine and what we tend to think of as witchcraft. In truth, a great many of the cures, in fact, had their bases in herbs that had real medicinal value. These cures were taught and handed down generation to generation because the availability of medical pract practitioners for the black population was not as ready as to the white. <clears throat> Uh, an interesting and amusing area of witchcraft surrounded the superstitions of the Black Cat Man. The Black Cat Man had putative powers for cure and for curse. The power of the Black Cat Man was not hard to come by. A black cat was taken to a stream by the full of the moon. This cat had to be totally black. A large kettle of boiling water was prepared and... What? Uh... And the cat was put in, and it was covered. I'm not going to read all of this out loud. That just sounds like cruelty to animals to me. All right. <clears throat> Here is one story I have heard which happened in Christiansburg sometime in the early part of this century. <laughs> Key squared, I'm so sorry. <laughs> the, the, uh, we are doing spooky stories. Uh, I was not expecting such description in this newspaper article from 1982 about ghosts and goblins and local folklore. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> a man was calling on a neighborhood woman of ill repute. The man's wife, discovering his infidelity, went to the black cat man and asked that a curse be put upon the woman and her house. The next day, in the dead of winter with several inches of snow on the ground, several boys were playing in the questionable woman's basement. They fa <sighs> Sorry, I just have to take one second to just note, referring to someone who does sex work as a woman of ill repute, or as a, a questionable woman is very demeaning to someone who is doing a job in order to earn a living. Uh, it is work. What our morality says about it is beside the point. It is something that that person is doing to earn a living and survive. So just had to say that. Uh, <clears throat> they found a black snake curled up on the wood pile. It, this was an unusual discovery for the season. Boys being boys, they took the snake outside and proceeded to beat it with a stick. Why? Leaving the snake for dead, the boys went home. A little later that day, they returned to get the snake, but it was gone. Rumors flew. The snake had crawled away. Was it a snake at all? Was it a manifestation of some curse? The gentleman caller heard the stories and went to the black cat man. The black cat man admitted that he had put a curse on the house because of his calling there. The other man, very much afraid for his life, begged for the release from the curse. After some persuasion, the black cat man told him that he was to find a branch shaped like antlers. He was to tie this branch to his head and wear it for a week. The man did so. The story ended by telling that the man was never unfaithful to his wife again. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, some silica. Uh, a little unclear on what constitutes a ghost story and what constitutes something you should report to the ASPCA. Indeed, 
Um, I'm, I'm not going to read more black cat stories. I'm going to look at what, what else do we have? I have an article here from the Collegiate Times, which is the Virginia Tech College newspaper. Um, incidentally, I learned recently as I was researching an exhibit that I was putting up that the Collegiate Times was originally founded by the Virginia Tech Athletic Association. Uh, both the, the college newspaper and the college bookstore were founded and run by the Athletics Association for quite a while. Uh, the many alleged hauntings of Montgomery County. We have, I'm not sure how, how well you can make it out, but we have um, as illustration a, a space and there are, um, it looks like two people that are just slightly exposed onto the film to, so that they look like they're ghosts. Um, every year in late October, with Halloween in mind, scary stories and tales of paranormal activity circulate through communities across the country. With such a rich history and plenty of college students and community members with overactive imaginations, Montgomery County is no, no exception. One of the closest haunted establishments to Virginia Tech's campus is the Lyric Theater, where two separate ghosts are said to inhabit. And now that I read that, that does indeed look like the lobby to the Lyric Theater in the picture. Um, Robert Seebeck, webmaster of the library and employee at the Lyric, described the first ghost as a woman who can be heard shrieking from the lobby late at night. Uh, this story is from 2013, and Robert Seebeck uh, indeed um, has been an employee at the library here at Virginia Tech for quite a while. Um, she supposedly inhabits the apartments above the theater, but not much else is known about her origins. The second phantom, Seebeck said, is a construction worker who fell off of a wall and died while the building was being built. We heard this story and thought we've heard we heard this story and thought we've heard that one a million times before we didn't really think it had any truth to it Seebeck said however the story became quite real when a woman came into the theater one day and told Seebeck and his co-workers that her grandfather had worked on the lyric but passed away in the same way the supposed ghost had falling off a wall that made it pretty creepy once we found that out Seebeck said the ghost had been known to make odd noises and touch employees while they clean up after hours. <clears throat> Brandon Brown, a junior industrial and systems engineering major, started a group at Tech about a month ago called Paranormal Investigations VT. Seeing as the group is in its beginning stages, the Lyric was the perfect place to start for their first search. With the assistance of the head, of, head paranormal investigator of the New River Valley, Brandon and some of the group members went to the theater with sound equipment, video recorders, and other devices they hoped would help them find evidence of the ghost. We had a difficult time at first because our sound recorders were so sensitive you could hear our feet touching the ground, which made it hard to hear other things, Brown said. While the group did not find any evidence during that outing, Brown said, we are still listening to the rest of the tapes, so hopefully we will find something. The group plans on going to places all around Montgomery County, including the haunted middle school and some abandoned buildings around the area. Another location that has had rumors swirling around it for years is the downtown restaurant Cabo Fish Taco. It is the second oldest building in Blacksburg and was built in 1847 originally as a Presbyterian church. The specific stories surrounding the restaurant are unclear in their origins, but may not be unfounded. The cooks have said things about uh, uh, the cooks have said things about things falling off of the shelves and odd stuff like that happening in the kitchen while they worked, said Richard Barrar, the general manager of Cabo Fish Taco. He also mentioned that people have have had strange experiences in the women's upstairs bathroom. Finally, possibly the most presumably haunted place in the New River Valley is the St. Albans Sanatorium in Radford. Ooh, that's a collection I could pull for October. We have a sanatorium collection. Makes a mental note. 
known for hauntings and apparitions that could have come directly out of a horror movie, the grounds of the building stands on sorry, the grounds the building stands on is known for numerous murders and early of early pioneers uh, by indigenous people in the late 18th century, even before the asylum itself was created. Once the building was built and began housing mental patients, it became infamous for many patient fac facilities uh, due to improper therapy techniques. To add to the horrific history, a man a woman named Gina Renee Hall was gruesomely murdered and left in her car just a few hundred yards from, the, from St. Albans on a nearby road. Reports from paranormal investigation crews have included full-bodied apparitions, threatening screams and voices, floating inanimate objects, and even, in some cases, physical contact. I know it used to be a mental hospital, but it closed down, said Matt Turk, a freshman aerospace engineering major from Radford. They were going to tear the building down altogether, but a paranormal in interest group raised funds to save it. Being from the area, Turk has had many personal experiences with the building since his childhood. He mentioned, we went in one time by ourselves and it was really scary, because you know what happened there. You hear stuff when it's dark and it really freaks you out. The location was even rated by many experienced paranormal investigation teams as one of the most active locations on the East Coast. Many tours are offered every year around Halloween. While these are only a few of the supposed hauntings Montgomery County has to offer, more sightings and rumors are reported every year. So I'm not 100% certain. I think that may be the sanatorium that we have the documents from. Uh, so we'll see how we do on stories this week, and I may pull the sanatorium collection for next week or the week after. I had forgotten we had that collection. So now I'm really happy that I <laughs> happened to pull this out and want to glance at local folklore. Um, let's see. We'll, we'll take a quick glance at the other folklore folder here. And then I want to look at some of these books that I pulled. I'm actually really excited that it's October and I get to look at spooky things from our collections. Um, we have jokingly said for years that our archives is haunted. Um, I don't know of any specific reason why we think that. Uh, we just blame anything that goes awry on the archives being haunted. Uh, let's see, this is from the Roanoke Times in 2004. Stories to make you shiver. A Roanoke, this would be Roanoke, Virginia. Local ghost stories are always a favorite on Halloween. Here are a few from across the New River Valley. Oh. I'm, I'm totally missing things. Crafty Becky, thank you for the follow. And uh, Main Mythic Misfit, thank you for the follow. A loud shriek like a banshee. Is the Lyric Theater in Blacksburg haunted? I've never heard or seen anything strange over the years while watching dozens of movies from the balcony. But others have. Roanoke native Jay Fur published the only written account of the Lyric Ghosts in 1995 seven years after his experiences there. Fur describes weird noises in old sections of the building while helping previous owner Beth Kelsey close up the place. Fur reports that one night he and Kelsey were in the projection booth high above the theater. It was a quiet night and we'd long since shooed everyone out and locked the doors. During, the lu during a lull in the conversation came a loud shriek. One would expect to hear if you had a banshee close at hand. According to Fur Kelsey and her husband, Bud Bennett, also sometimes heard a woman scream, let me out, let me out. Others have heard what sounded like someone clomping up and down the back stairwell that leads to the projection room, Fur says. The old, that old stairwell, now used as an emergency exit for the balcony, allegedly hosts the most famous lyric haunt, the supposed ghost of a construction worker who died when he fell from the roof. 
Long, longtime Lyric volunteer Robert Seebeck said in an interview three years ago that even though he has heard strange noises in the building over the years, he was dubious about the construction worker ghost story. Imagine his surprise when a woman walked up to the theater's information table during the Steppin' Out Street Festival and told him about her grandfather who died there. It's an old, old building, and it feels pretty weird sometimes, caretaker Clarence Sink said of the... Oh, sorry. That was the end of that story. Now we have a d another one. <laughs> Things have definitely happened here that we just don't understand. It's an old, old building, and it feels pretty weird sometimes, caretaker Clarence Sink said of the Wilderness Road Regional Museum in New Bern. The museum's main building dates back to 1810. Legend has it that a man was killed there for cheating in a card game that used to take place upstairs. Sink, who has worked at the museum for 12 years, said he gets those creepy feelings most often on cloudy, rainy days. You feel like someone's watching you and all the pictures on the wall seem like they're staring at you, especially when you're alone and it's all quiet, he said. Sometimes the screen door in the back opens by itself, just wide enough for someone to slip in. Then you go and look, and there's never anybody there. Perhaps it's the ill-fated card shark coming back to check his hand. Or it could be one of the two people who were hung down the street at the town's old jail. Things have definitely happened here that we just don't understand, said Ann Bailey, who had ser has served as the museum's executive director for 24 years. Sometimes things seem to move on their own. Or you'll hear a noise, like a ball, slowly bouncing upstairs. It's spooky. Newburn's Historic Museum and its ghosts have found their way into at least two books, The Mystery of Ghostly Verna and Southwest Virginia Crossroads, an almanac of place names and places to see. Visit the museum sometime and wander upstairs by yourself among the old furniture, clothes, uniforms, and pictures. Someone or something may be looking back. I love ghost stories. <laughs> These aren't even true ghost stories. These are just like newspaper articles about ghost stories. All right. I don't know what to expect from this one. I think we'll look at it and we'll see. And if we don't like it, we can stop. Haunted in the NRV. So the NRV would be the New River Valley. Uh, <clears throat> which is where Virginia Tech is located. It, it, it's a geographic description of the area, the new river running through the area, and us being in a valley. So, haunted in the NRV. On the dusty porch of the abandoned mansion, up on the hill in front, uh, the front door opens by its own volition, making a slow and long creak. Figures dressed in attire from generations past shimmer in and out of view. Whispers not formed by the night wind speak in all but forgotten graveyards. While rational thinking and basic logic offer explanation to account for the mysterious, there still remain pieces, places that have an extraordinary sense of unrest. Places that once were the setting for heinous and horrifying acts. Places that could contain the presence of a life ended prematurely. Places that some claim to be haunted. And with Southwest Virginia's rich and colorful, oftentimes dark, past, we have our share of haunted places. The Black Sisters. If you're looking for the scariest place in Montgomery County, you're standing in front of it said Kevin Sutherland, 21, case manager and historian for the New River Valley Paranormal Society. When we visited here last, we got spooked. And we don't get spooked. Sutherland was standing at 208 College Street in front of what is now the Rivendell School for Alternative Education, a large rectangular two-story building built in, the 1930, built in 1935 that previously housed Christiansburg Middle and High Schools. 
Upon arrival to the site one night with members of his group, he witnessed a flickering of lights in the school's windows accompanied with cold chills and eerie feelings. He even claims a member of his group was physically moved across the ground by an unknown force. Over the years, employees of the school and residents have reported similar phenomena, and many believe the haunting is rooted over a century ago when the Montgomery Female College, which was demolished and replaced by the high school, stood at that location. The macabre tales of haunting began when the college fell into the hands of Mary, Virginia, and Catherine Wardlaw. They were reportedly the, they were reported to wear, sorry, they were reported to only wear black. And because of this and their sinister deeds, they are forever known as the Black Sisters. Sutherland has heard tales of the sisters torturing and even murdering students, throwing their bodies into a well on the college's campus. Though these stories are most likely untrue and no court records could be found to verify them, other eerie events occurred that have been verified. Hack drivers, horse and buggy taxi drivers, at the time reported frequently driving the sisters to the graveyard, where they would chant over the resting dead. Lula Porterfield Givens, in her book Christiansburg, Montgomery County, Virginia, in the heart of the Alleghenies, wrote that the sisters were veiled in gloom and reported that the townspeople of Christiansburg were afraid to answer their doors or to walk the streets at night because of the sisters. The Black Sisters left Christiansburg after the death of Mary's 28-year-old son, John, a teacher at the college who had been generously insured by his aunts. He died shortly after complications that arose from being burned in his own bed. The sheets were soaked in kerosene. Years later, John's niece was found starved to death in the sisters' bathtub in their New Jersey home. All three sisters were indicted for murder after it was learned that the niece had left a sizable will to her gr grandmother, Mary Wardlaw. Uh, Virginia starved herself to death before the trial. Mary pleaded guilty to manslaughter, and Caroline was sent to the New, New Jersey State Prison. The next one starts a, a new story that I don't think is fully there, so I'm not going to start reading it, but interesting. I was not aware of those sisters. <laughs> All right. Let's see. We've been on for a half hour. Let me, let me show off some of the things that I found in our rare books collection, and we can talk about them. Because... I am definitely not um, a literary scholar, so hopefully some of you will know more about these authors that I located than I do. And by, I, by hopefully some of you, uh, I sort of hope that Kira's here, but uh, I don't know if she could make it today. She's got other things to prepare for. <clears throat> so the first item is this little book, Strange Fantastic Adventures in Other Times and Other Worlds, uh, costing 25 cents. Uh, the story on the cover is The Garden of Fear, the art on this item. Um, appears to have been done by Alva Rogers in 1945. Uh, the Garden of Fear being by Robert E. Howard. Let's see. The Garden of Fear by Robert E. Howard and other stories of the bizarre and fantastic. A Crawford publication. Los Angeles, California. Let's see, the stories that are in here, The Garden of Fear, The Man with the Hourglass, uh, Cellophase by Lovecraft, 
Mars colonizes the Golden Bow. I don't know Celeface. That is one I've never heard of. Honestly, I haven't really read a lot of Lovecraft, though. I, I do enjoy a good Cthulhu, uh, but um, I've always steered clear of it because Lovecraft himself was a questionable person. But I do enjoy like the, the fiction itself. Uh, so that's one option here. Let's see what else we have. The Bell in the Fog by Gertrude Atherton. So I was doing searches of our collections for uh, ghost stories and, and things like that. Um, I believe this has multiple stories in it. So let's see what triggered this. The Bell in the Fog and Other Stories. We have a lovely picture of Gertrude Atherton. Uh, this was published in 1905, which means I am most definitely in the clear for reading from this book, if we find something interesting. To the master, Henry James. All right, so I'm going to look up who G Gertrude Atherton is, and let's find out. Oh, you know what? I can leave the stream up so that I can see chat while I do this on this tablet device that I have located conveniently nearby. All right, let's find out who Gertrude Atherton is. Unless anybody happens to know and wants to drop that information in chat. All right. So for basic primer information, my starting point generally happens to be Wikipedia. And there is nothing at all wrong with starting with Wikipedia for basic primer. If you know nothing about a topic and you just want a summary, Wikipedia is great. Um, you can be relatively confident that it is going to be somewhat accurate. And for basic knowledge where you just need some surface level stuff, it's not a bad source. They require things be linked to other sources, uh, published sources, um, which generally means it's somewhat reliable. But you wouldn't want to rely on it for uh, something you were going to publish yourself, uh, for writing, for things like that. You don't want to rely on it for making major decisions in your own life. But if you just want some, like, I'm curious about this subject, and you just want to know some basic top-level stuff, it's often a really good starting point. So this from a librarian. A quick Googling reveres that Alva Red Rogers, fantasy artist, is not the same as Alva Rogers, mermaid actor. But you haven't learned much more than that. <laughs> um, interesting. This would be the fantasy artist, I think. All right, Gertrude Atherton. Gertrude Franklin Horn Atherton, born October 30th, 1857. And sadly, the portrait has come out of this book, but it lets me center it more easily. Um, I'll show you the portrait while I read to you this uh, basic information about this person. Uh, was an American author. Many of her novels are set in her home state of California. Her bestseller, Black Oxen, 1923, was made into a silent movie of the same name. In addition to novels, she wrote short stories, essays, and articles for magazines and newspapers on such issues as feminism, politics, and war. She was a white supremacist. It, it flatly says that in the opening paragraph here, uh, which I'm thankful that it tells me. There is not a linked source for that, but I'm looking. Oh. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, there's some not great things there. <laughs> Laugh and resist. Thank you for redeeming a hydrate. I will I will drink some water while I um while I pretend to be shocked that a an a classic American literary author in our rare books collection was a white supremacist. <laughs> Um, okay, well, if you want to know more about uh, Gertrude Atherton's white supremacist views, um, you, you can take a look. There is a Wikipedia article about her uh, that said we do know that, um, you know, we can look at the works that they produced and analyze them. This... Uh, if there is a spooky story in here, I'm willing to read it. Let's see what caused me to pull this. The stories in this book are The Bell in the Fog, The Striding Place, The Dead and the Countess, The Greatest Good of the Greatest Number, A Monarch of a Small Survey, The Tragedy of a Snob, Crowned with One Crest, Death and the Woman, a prologue to an unwritten play, and Talbot of Ursula. Let me see if I can get any information about any of these book or stories. Atherton, The Bell in the Fog. Honestly, I'm not surprised to find white supremacists in any of our rare books and in any of our collections. This is in American archives. Um, <laughs> Our American archives are full of lots of stuff from white people, um, which means that they're going to be full of lots of stuff from uh, white supremacists. This could be an interesting story. Uh, we'll keep this as an option, but I've got other options as well. But this one, I, I may be able to actually read The Bell in the Fog. It seems like it might be a spooky story for us. <clears throat> After Gertrude Atherton, I also have Washington Irving. Um, Rip Van Winkle, this one is also old enough that I can definitely read this aloud on stream if I want. Um, I think this is literally just the story of Rip Van Winkle. I thought it was going to be uh, other short stories. But look at these lovely pages and how they are illustrated. <clears throat> I don't know that I would consider Rip Van Winkle a spooky story. <clears throat> so I'm not certain... I had thought that it mentioned something about the Headless Horseman when I, uh... Oh, yes, there it is. Yeah, after Rip Van Winkle in this book is The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. So I may, may read that very shortly, although it is rather lengthy, so I don't know. Uh, one thing that I should show you all, I have 
the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe. So if there is an Edgar Allan Poe story that you would like for me to read, do let me know, and I'm happy to do so. Um, this is a total of four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten volumes. Uh, these volumes were published <clears throat> in, let's see, this is the, Arn Arnhem, the Arnheim edition. Um, signed and numbered. Complete works of Edgar Allan Poe. Edited and chronologically arranged on the basis of the standard text with certain additional material and with critical introduction by Charles F. Richardson. Um, these were published in 1902. You, you used to live next to Sleepy Hollow. That is awesome. So this is, uh, Poe is what I was expecting that we would actually read aloud today, but I wanted to show off some of these other things first. Um, and we don't have to do everything today. I have an entire month, and we can go into November with spooky stuff if we want to. Uh, I have The Two Magics by Henry James, um, which includes, I believe, uh, The Turn of the Screw and Covering End. The Turn of the Screw is a bit lengthy to try and do in one stream. Um, I had to read The Turn of the Screw in high school. Uh, but, so Henry James, that, this one is from uh, 1898. Uh, is everybody familiar with The Turn of the Screw? That's, I had to read it in high school, so it's one of those things where I just assume everybody knows it. Um, I have The Bells by Edgar Allan Poe, illustrated. This one might be a good one to do on stream. This is from 1881. It is in um, somewhat poor condition. The spine is bad enough that it was tied in um, cloth or cotton string. Um, well, let's do this, it's illustrated. The Bells by Edgar A. Poe. Illustrated by Darley McCutcheon, Fredericks, Perkins, King, Rorden, and Northam. Published by the John C. Winston Company, Philadelphia. I don't know this story, I don't think. Copyright 1881 by Porter and Coates. That is a publishing company that I know the name of. We have a list of illustrations. The Bells. Oh, is it? I'm just checking so I can adjust uh, text is only on one page, so I'm going to scoot it over so that you can see things clearly. Hear the sledges with the bells, silver bells. What a world of merriment their melody foretells. Is this a Christmas story from Poe? How they tinkle, tinkle, tinkle in the icy air of night, while the stars that oversprinkle all the heavens seem to twilight with a crystalline delight, keeping time, time, time in a sort of runic rhyme to the tintinabulation that so musically wells from the bells, 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 from the jingling and the tinkling of the bells. Hear the mellow wedding bells. Go 
golden bells, what a world of happiness their harmony foretells. Through the balmy air of night, how they ring out their delight. From the molten golden notes, and all in tune, what a liquidy ditty floats to the turtle dove that listens while she gloats on the moon. Oh, from out the sounding cells, what a gush of euphony voluminously wells. How it swells, how it dwells on the future, how it tells of the rapture that impels. To the swinging and the ringing of the bells, 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 of the bells, 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 to the rhyming and the chiming of the bells. Hear the loud alarm bells, brazen bells, what a tale of terror now their turbulency tells in the startled ear of night. How they scream out their affright, too much horrified to speak, they can only shriek, shriek out of tune. In the clamorous appealing to the mercy of the fire. In a mad expostulation with the deaf and frantic fire leaping higher, 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 what a desperate, with a desperate desire and a resolute endeavor, now, now, to sit or never by the side of the pale-faced moon. Oh, what, oh, the bells, 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 what a tale their terror tells of despair. How they clang and clash and roar, what a horror they outpour on the bosom of the palpitating air. Yet the ear it fully knows by the twanging and the clanging how the danger ebbs and flows. Yet the ear distinctly tells in the jangling and the wrangling how the danger sinks and swells by the sinking or the swelling in the anger of the bells, of the bells of the bells, 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 in the clamor and the clangor of the bells. Hear the tolling of the bells, iron bells, what a world of solemn thought their monod monody compels. In the silence of the night, how we shiver with affright at the melancholy menace of their tone. For every sound that floats from the rust within their throats is a groan. And the people, ah, the people, they that dwell up in the steeple, all alone and who toiling, 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 in that muffled monotone feel a glory in so rolling on the human heart a stone, they are near man nor, they are neither man nor woman, they are neither brute nor human, they are ghoul. And their king it is who tolls, and he rolls, 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 rolls a pain from the bells, and his merry bosom swells with the pain of the bells, and he dances and he yells, keeping time, time, time in a sort of runic rhyme to the pain of the bells, of the bells. keeping time, time, time in a sort of runic rhyme to the throbbing of the bells of the bells, 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 to the sobbing of the bells, keeping time, time, time as he knells, knells, knells in a happy runic rhyme to the rolling of the bells of the bells, 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 to the tolling of the bells of the bells, 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 to the moaning and the groaning of the bells. I had never heard that one before. I did not know what to expect. I've never read it before. Um, <coughs> it definitely has a, a very particular rhythm and the repetition of bells is like when you strike a bell and it just rings and there's that kind of echo after it. It's kind of replicated in the, the structure of how he put it together. That was really fun. You remember this being set to music. That would be really interesting. That's really cool, and the illustrations are nice. Yeah, it is a gorgeous cover. And, and it started out 
talking about sleigh bells and and I was like is this gonna be like did I pull the one like non creepy Edgar Allan Poe story but no it got creepy <laughs> I just, I, I know some Poe, I don't know all Poe. Um, I, I was, I studied acting, I did not study literature. <laughs> and then I studied community, which is still not literature. I have selections from Poe's Marginalia. Uh, ooh. I also have the collected poems of John Macefield. I do not know who John Macefield is. Again, not a literary scholar. Oh, <laughs> but it made me a great reader. Thank you, Key Squared. I try. Um, that was sight reading. If I had practice, I could have probably done like a better like performance. Um, let's see. John Macefield. Because I don't know who this person is either. John Edward Macefield born June 1st, 1878, was an English poet and writer and poet laureate from 1930 to 1967. Among his best known works are the children's novels, The Midnight Folk and The Box of Delights and the poems, poems The Everlasting Mercy and Sea Fever. He was the poet laureate of the United Kingdom from 1930 to 1967. So let us see. Uh, there was something in here that sparked to my ghost or uh, spooky stories searches. The con a con consecration, the yarn of the Loch Acre, sing a song of shipwreck, burial party, bill, fever ship, fever chills, one of the bosun's yarns, hell's pavement, Sea Change, Harbor Bar, The Turn of the Tide, One of Wally's Yarns, A Valediction, A Night at Dago Toms, Port of Many Ships, Cape Horn Gospel 1 and 2, Mother Carey, Evening, Regatta Day, A Valediction, A Pierhead Chorus, The Golden City of St. Mary, Trade Winds, Sea Fever, A Wanderer's Song, and Cardigan Bay. I'm curious about Hell's Pavement. Oh my gosh, there's, there's more. It's not just that one page. Oh, let's see. The Watch in the Wood, The Death Rooms. Widow in the By Street. Huh. All right. Hell's Pavement, possibly. But first, The Death Rooms by John Macefield. Um, when was this published? Signed in the front, I'm not sure by who, uh, in 1923, which is interesting. Yeah, so this is published in 1923. The Death Rooms. My soul has many an old decaying room hung with the ragged hours of the past, where startled faces flicker in the groom the gloom and horrid whispers set the cheek aghast. Those dropping rooms are haunted by a death, a something like a worm gnawing a brain that bids me heed what bitter lesson saith, the blind wind beating on the window pane. None dwells in those old rooms, none ever can. I pass them through at night with hidden head, locked rotting rooms her eyes must never scan. Floors that her blessed feet must never tread. Haunted old rooms, 
rooms she must never know, where death ticks knock and moldering panels glow. Apparently, I'm guessing that means it was written at Coram Street. Short poems are super easy for, for streaming. Long works less easy. But let's see, page 14 I thought it was. Okay, I've got page 13 and 16. Hell's Pavement. Today you learned Aras equals tapestry, specifically that used for hangings covering the walls of a room. Interesting, I did not know that either. So thank you for sharing that. I just read the word and I <laughs> was reading the poetry and trying to pronounce things properly. Um, Hell's Pavement by John Macefield. When I'm discharged in Liverpool and draws my bit of pay, I won't come to see no more. I'll court a pretty little lass and have a wedding day and settle somewhere down ashore. I'll never fare to see again a tempting Davy Jones a hearkening to the cruel sharks a hungering for my bones. I'll run a blushing dairy farm and go a crackin' stones or buy and keep a little liquor store, so he said. They towed her into Liverpool, we made the hooker fast, and the copper-bound officials paid the crew, and Billy drew his money, but the money didn't last, for he painted the longshore blue. <clears throat> it was rum for Pole, and rum for Nan, and gin for Jolly Jack. He shipped a week later in the clothes upon his back. He had to pinch a little straw, he had to beg a sack to sleep on when his watch was through. So he did. So not so much to do with hell as, I guess hell's pavement was the uh, coming ashore for the person used to life at sea and then spending all his money on the amenities therein. Interesting. <laughs> I, it, um, so I was completely guessing, Millie, on the pronunciation, but it seemed like it should be pronounced similar to aura. Um, and so I just went sort of in that direction with it. Uh, here we have selections from Poe's Marginalia. Um, I don't know Poe's Marginalia. So I'm not sure what to expect. Again, not a literary scholar. Uh, I guess these are just like notes that he wrote to himself in the margins. So maybe not the best since I have no idea what they're actually referring to. I will read one and we will see. We of the 19th century need some worker of miracles for our own regeneration, but so degraded have we become that the only prophet or preacher who could render us much service would be the St. Francis who converted the beasts. I don't know. It is very nice to look at. I just, I think. I, I'm uncertain. I'm guessing they chose ones to publish that seemed like they could stand on their own. Uh, because otherwise, why would you publish something like this? In drawing a line of distinction between a people and a mob, we shall find that a people aroused to action are a mob, and that a mob, trying to think, subside, subside into people. Interesting. Let's see what else. I have The Ghost by Arnold Bennett in a lovely blue cover here. Um, 
1907 this. I don't think uh, the ghost, a Fantasia on modern times. Um, I think it's a novel, so I don't think I will have the time needed to read this, but uh, if you're at all interested, apparently Arnold Bennett wrote a book called The Ghost. I don't know anything about Bennett or this book. Um, let me see what we can find. This is my favorite part of this is like, I pulled it based on a couple of like, typed in the word ghost and pulled everything that, that came up. Arnold, Enoch Arnold Bennett, born May 27th, 1867, was an English author best known as a novelist. He was a prolific writer between the start of his career in 1898 and his death, he completed 34 novels, seven volumes of short stories, 13 plays, and a daily journal totaling more than a million words. He wrote articles and stories for more than 100 different newspapers and periodicals, worked in and briefly ran the Ministry of Information in the First World War, and wrote for the cinema in the 1920s. Apparently, the sales of his books were substantial, and he was the most financially successful British author of his day. Uh, works. List of works by Arnold Bennett. We're looking at the ghost. It is a novel. <laughs> it is not one of his books of short stories. So it's, it's nice to look at. Um, I don't have time for it on stream. Um, yeah, we're definitely not getting to the, uh, the pulp today. We'll just look at the novels today, or the, the, these today, and we'll do pulp another day. Um, we have Carriston's Gift by Hugh Conway. which I am not familiar with. Um, and I do apologize for the illustration on the cover, including an arachnid. I am highly arachnophobic, and so I'm just attempting not to look at the illustration, but I apologize to anybody else uh, <laughs> who may also be bothered. Um, let's see. Hugh Conway, the pen name of Frederick John Fargus, born 26 December 1847, was an English novelist born in Bristol, the son of an auctioneer. He had success with his fiction in the early 1880s. Fargus was intended for his father's business, but at the age of 13, joined a mercy school trip, uh, joined a mercy school ship Conway named Conway, lent by the Admiralty for Training Merchant Navy Officers. In deference to his father's wishes, however, he returned to Bristol, where he was articled to a firm of accountants until his father's death in 1868, when he took over the family auctioneering business. Huh. Uh, let's see. While a clerk, Fargus had written words for various songs, adopting the pen name Hugh Conway in memory of his training ship days. James Williams Aerosmith, a Bristol printer and publisher, took an interest, and Fargus's first short story appeared in Aerosmith's Miscellany. In 1883, Fargus published through Aerosmith his first novella, Called Back, an early thriller that sold over 350,000 copies in four years. One admirer of the book was the American poet Emily Dickinson. A stage version of it appeared in London in 1884 when Fargus published another short story, another story, Dark Days. So what about this one? Okay, so this is Carriston's Gift and Other Tales. It includes Carriston's Gift, uh, Chewton Abbott, Paul Vargas, A Dead Man's Face, Julian Vanek, and the Bihwa. So 
so let us take a look. You're just all starry-eyed about the book bindings. Yeah, they are, um, sometimes I like to, like, especially the shelf where this one was, sometimes I just like to wander down that aisle because they all the bindings on that aisle are like, are like this. They're all colorful. They all have the embossed illustration. Um, I'll have to just pull them out and we'll explore um, sometime. I don't know much about how those bindings were done or why, why all of the books in that section all look like this. So that would be something interesting to explore on stream sometime. I think that these were, uh, my theory is that they were published to appeal to young young men or like older boys, like um, boys aged, like uh, the age that would have been interested in like the Hardy Boys books in America and that the covers being illustrated in this way was part of trying to attract them as customers. Um, that is my guess, uh, but I don't know for certain. Frederick John Fergus. Kariston's Gift and Other Tales. <clears throat> With a portrait of the author and other illustrations. This one happened to be published in New York by Henry Holt and Company in 1885. And I need to be gentle with it because these pages are, uh, at least those front pages are starting to crack. Kirsten's Gift. Part one, told by Philip Brand, MD, London. I wish I had the courage to begin this tale by turning to my professional visiting books and talk and talking at random any month out of the lat or sorry and taking I wish I had the courage to begin this tale by turning to my professional visiting books and taking at random any month out of the last 20 years give its records as a fair sample of my ordinary work the dismal extract would tell you what a doctor's, I suppose I may say a successful doctor's, lot is when his practice lies in a poor and densely populated district in London. Dreary as such a beginning might be, it would perhaps allay some of the incredulity which this tale may probably provo provoke, as it would plainly show how little room there is for things imaginative or romantic in work so hard as mine or among such grim realities of poverty, pain, and grief as those by which I have been surrounded. It would certainly make it appear extremely unlikely that I should have found time to imagine, much less to write, a romance or melodrama. The truth is that when a man has toiled from nine o'clock in the morning until nine o'clock at night, such leisure as he can enjoy is precious to him especially when given that short respite, is liable to be broken in upon at any moment. Wait, did he just say a second ago that he wrote this, that this is a romance or melodrama? That's not what we're looking for today. I'll have to return to this. Um, was not worth it. That, that would be possible. I don't know. This is the only book that I pulled from that section because it was the only one that indicated it had uh, spooky stories in it. Um, but yeah, that is that is a good theory that it maybe those were all published by the same publisher. All right, we're skipping over the romance. Uh, Chuton Abbott. I don't think that's gonna be it. I wonder why this showed up in my search. A dead man's face. Maybe that's why it showed up in my search. Let's take a look at a dead man's face. Okay, phrasing. Uh, <laughs> that didn't come out quite how I liked. Oh my gosh, Scruff, I am so sorry. Hi, uh, I just noticed that you've been um, <laughs> posting in the chat over here and I don't know how long ago it was. Um, 
Yes, spooky stories. <laughs> I, just, I had most of the chat happening to my right and I didn't notice and I'm sorry. Yeah, spooky stories. Right now we're looking at a uh, Kariston's Gift and Other Stories by Hugh Conway. Um, trying to see why it po popped when I did a search for spooky stories. Um, a Dead Man's Face. Imaginat imaginative beings who invent marvelous tales may take what license they please, but a simple narrator is nothing if not accurate. So before beginning this, I looked up old correspondences and various memoranda made at the time when the following things occurred. The first paper upon which I put my hand was a letter. I may as well open with a copy of it. Dear old boy, I have met her at last, my fate, the one woman in the world for me. Nothing is settled as yet, but I should not write this unless hope were a certainty. You must wish me joy, although she is a widow and an American, two qualifications which I know you will find fault with. No matter, when you see her, you will recant and be envious. Yours ever, Claude Morton. The writer was my brother. I was going to say my only brother, but I had another once. Although the less said about him, the better. Nearly every family has its black sheep. Our, ours had been a peculiarly sable one. When he died some years ago, I passed a sponge over his long list of de delinquencies and tried to think of him as kindly as possible. He died a disgraced man, far from home. I call this black sheep Stephen, my brother, not Claude's. The fact being that Claude can scarcely be said to have known him. I stood in age midway between the two. Claude was 16 years younger than Stephen, so that when the latter was shipped off as irreclaimable, the former was a little golden-haired fellow of seven. The above letter made me feel both glad and sorry. I was glad that the boy, he was still the boy to me, although his age was seven and twenty, was going to be married. But I was sorry that his choice had not fallen on one of his own countrywomen and one who could have given him her first love. Still, all this was his own peculiar business. No doubt he had made a suitable choice, and the only thing left for me to do was to write him a cheerful letter of congrat congratulation and hope that his love affairs would soon be happily settled. A week went by, then came a long letter from him. He had proposed in orthodox form and had been duly accepted. His letter lies before me at the moment, and I feel sad as I read again the two pages covered with the lover's usual raptures. I am not a mercenary man, but I own, uh, but I own I felt somewhat disappointed. That is a strange construction. I am not a mercenary man, but I own I felt somewhat disappointed on learning that she was poor. Somehow one associates wealth with an American widow who is sojourning in England. But so far as I could gather from Claude's letter, Mrs. Despard, or Judith as he called her, was not well off. He spoke of her as being all alone in London, which fact, he added, would necessar necessarily hasten his marriage. It would take place, he hoped, in a week or two. In conclusion, he pressed me to run up to town in order to make the acquaintance of my future sister-in-law. I own. Oh, I acknowledge. Thank you, Millie Glitch. Wait, Portico, what shenanigans? Um, I was very busy at the time, I may say in passing, that my business is to cure people's ailments, not to tell stories. Nevertheless, I managed to pay a flying visit to town and was duly presented to Claude's betrothed. Yes, she was handsome, strikingly handsome. Her whole appearance was much out of the common. She was tall, superbly built, on a large scale perhaps, yet graceful as a panther in every movement. Her face gave evidence of much character, power and determination, and of passion also, I decided. Uh, her rich dark beauty was at that time in full bloom, and although I saw at a glance that she was some years older than my brother, I was not at all inclined to blame Claude for his rapturous ex expressions. So far as personal charms went, I could find no fault with, Judith's Des with Judith Despard. 
For the rest, it was easy to see that she was passionately in love with Claude, and for the sake of this, I gladly overlooked all my fanciful ob objections to his choice and congratulated him heartily on having won so beautiful a creature. Yet, strange to say, in the midst of the, his newfound happiness, my brother seemed anything but his usual cheerful self. He, the merriest and most talkative of men, seemed taciturn, moody, and preoccupied. The curious thing was that his changed manner struck me particularly while we were in Mrs. Despard's company. He spoke and behaved in the most affectionate and lover-like way, but there was in his general bearing something which puzzled me altogether. It seemed to me that he might perhaps be nervous as to what impression his fair friend might make upon the elder brother whom he so rever reverenced and respected. This theory of mine was strengthened by the fact that when, at night, we found ourselves alone and I was able to freely express my admiration of Mrs. Despard's good looks, he brightened up considerably, and we sat until a very late hour and talked over, t over the past, the present, and the future. When do you mean to be married? I asked. In a fortnight or three weeks. There is nothing to wait for. Judith is living alone in lodgings. She has no friends to consult, so we shall just walk to church some morning and get it over. Well, let me walk with you. I should like to see the last of you. All right, old fellow. You'll be the only one unless Mary likes to honor us. Mary was my wife, but as her time was just then fully occupied by, by a very young baby, I did not think it at all likely she would be able to make the long journey to town. I shall fix the earliest day I can, added Claude. The fact is, I have been feeling rather queer lately. I want to change. Thereupon, I questioned him as to what ailed him. So far as I could ascertain, all that was the matter was his having worked too hard and being a little below par. I prescribed a tonic and quite agreed with him as to the ben benefit which he would derive from change of air. When I reached my home, when I reached home, my wife scolded me for my stupidity. It seems that it was my duty to have found out all about Mrs. Despard's er, antecedents, relations, connections, circumstances, habits, and disposition, whereas all I could say was that she was a beautiful widow with a small income and that she and Claude were devoted to each other. Yes, said Mrs. Morton scornfully, like all other men, the moment you see a pretty face, you inquire no further. I quite tremble for Claude. When I reflected how little I really knew about Mrs. Despard, I felt abashed and guilty. However, Claude was a full-grown man, and no fraternal counsel was likely to turn him aside from his desire. In the course of a few days, he wrote me that he was to be married on the 5th of the, of the next month. I made arrangements which would enable me to go to the wedding, but three days before the date named, I heard again from him. The wedding was postponed for a fortnight. He gave no reason for the delay, but he said he was anxious to see me, and tomorrow he should run down to my home. He came as promised. I was aghast when I saw him. He looked worn, haggard, wretched. My first thought was that business had gone wrong with him. His looks might well be those of a man on the brink of ruin. After the first greeting, I at once took him to my study in order to be put out of suspense. Just as I was about to begin my anxious questions, he turned to me, Frank, old fellow he said imploringly, and with a faint attempt at a smile, don't laugh at me. Laugh? That was the last thing I was likely to do. I pressed his hand in silence. You won't believe me, I know, he continued. I can't believe it myself. Frank, I am haunted. Haunted? I was bound to smile, not from any disposition toward merriment, but in order to show the poor boy the absurdity of his idea. Yes, haunted. The word sounds ridiculous, but I can use no other haunted. What haunts you? He came close to me and grasped my arm. His voice sank to a hoarse whisper. A horrible, ghastly, gruesome thing. It is killing me. It comes between me and my happiness. I have fought and struggled against this phantom terror. I have reasoned calmly with myself. I have laughed my own folly to scorn. In vain, in vain. It goes, but it comes again. Overwork, I said, insomnia, too many cigars, late hours. And had you been a drinking man, I should add, too much stimulant, too little food, anxiety, perhaps. Have you anything on your mind, any special worry? Of course I have, he said pettishly. 
Did I not tell you it is killing me? What is killing you? He rose and paced the room excitedly. Then suddenly he stopped short and once more clutched my arm. A face, he said wildly. A man's face, a fearful white face that comes to me. A horrible mask with features drawn in an agony, ghastly, pale, hideous. Death or approaching death, violent death, written in every line. Every feature distorted, eyes staring from the head, every cord in the throat standing out, strained as by mortal struggle. Long, dark hair lying flat and wet, thin lips moving and working, lips that are cursing, although I hear no sound. Why should this come to me? Why to me? Who is this dead man whose face wrecks my life? Frank, my brother, if this is disease or madness, cure me. If not, let me die. His words, his gestures sent a cold thrill through me. He was worse, far worse than I had feared. Claude, I said, are you talking nonsense? Cure you. Of course I mean to cure you. Now sit down, collect yourself, and tell me how this hallucination comes. Comes? How does it come? It gathers in corners of the room. It forms and takes shape. It glares at me out of the wall. It looks up at me from the floor. Ever the same fearful, white, dying face, threatening, cursing, sometimes mocking. Why does it come? I had already told the poor fellow why it came, but it was no use repeating my words. Tell me when you see it, I asked. At night? In darkness? He hesitated and seemed troubled. No, no, never, never at night. In broad daylight only. That, to me, is the crowning terror, the ghastliness of it. At night I could call it a dream. Frank, believe me, I am no weak fool. For weeks I have borne with this. At last it has conquered me. Send it away or I shall go mad. I'll send it away, old boy, never fear. Tell me, can you see it now? No, thank God, not now. Have you seen it today? No, today I have been free from it. Well, you'll be free from it tomorrow and the next day and the next. It will be gone forever before you leave me. Now come and see Mary and the babies. I haven't even asked you how Mrs. Desperate is. A curious look crossed his face. I think she grows more beautiful every day, he said. Then he seized my hand. Oh, Frank, he exclaimed, rid me of this horror and I shall be the happiest man in the world. All right, I answered, perhaps with more confidence than I felt. Although I made light of it to my patient, his state greatly alarmed me. I hastened to put him under the strictest and most approved treatment. I enforced the most rigid sumptuary laws, made him live on plain food, and docked his cons cons consumption of tobacco unmercifully. In a few days, I was delighted to find that my diagnosis of the case was correct. Claude was rapidly recovering tone. In a week's time, he seemed restored to health. The days went by. As yet, Claude had said nothing about leaving me, yet unless the date was once more adjourned, he was to be married on the 19th. I did not counsel him to postpone the happy day. He was by now so well that I thought he could not do better than adhere to his arrangement. A month's holiday spent in the society of the woman he loved would, I felt certain, complete his cure and banish forever the grisly intruder begotten of disorganized nerves. From the monotonous regularity and voluminous nature of their correspondence, it was evident, delay and separation notwithstanding, that matters were going on quite smoothly between Claude and Judith Despard. Every day he received and wrote a long letter. Nevertheless, it was not until the 16th of the month that I knew exactly what he meant to do about his marriage. <clears throat> Frank, he said, you have been wonderfully kind to me. I believe you have saved my life, or at least my reason. Will you do something more for me? Even unto half my kingdom, I answered. Look here, I am ashamed of the feeling, but I absolutely dread returning to town. At any rate, I wish to stay here no longer than is needful. Thursday morning I must, of course, be there to be married. You think me cured, Frank? He asked abruptly. Honestly, yes. If you take care of yourself, you will be troubled no more. Yet why do I dread London so? Well, well never mind. I will go up by the night mail on Wednesday. Then I need only be there for a few hours. Will you do this for me? Go up on Wednesday morning, see Judith, and explain how it is that I shall not see her until we meet in the church? <clears throat> Certainly, if you wish, but you had better write as well. Yes, I shall do that. There are several other little things you must see to for me. The license I have, but you must let the clergyman know. 
you had better go and see my partners. They, will, they may think it strange if I marry and go away without a word. Thinking it better that he should have his own way, I promised to do as he wished. Upon my arrival in town on Wednesday afternoon, I went straight to Mrs. Despert's. I was not sorry to have this opportunity of seeing her alone. I wished to urge upon her the necess necessity of being careful that Claude did not again get into that highly wrought nervous state from which my treatment had so it happily extricated him. <clears throat> she was not looking so well as when last I saw her. At times her manner was restless and she seemed striving to suppress agitation. She made no adverse comments on her lover's strange whim of reaching town tomorrow only in time for the ceremony. Her inquiries as to his health were most solicitous, and when I told her that I no longer feared anything on his account, her heartfelt sigh of relief told me how deeply she loved him. Presently she looked me full in the face. Her eyes were half closed, but I could see an anxious, eager look in them. He saw a face, she said. Has it left him? He told you of his queer hallucination then? No. But once or twice, when sitting with me, he sprang to his feet and muttered, Oh, that face! That ghastly, horrible face! I can bear it no longer! Then he rushed wildly from the room. What face did he see, Dr. Morton? <clears throat> to set her mind at ease, I gave her a little scientific discourse, which explained to her how such mental phenomena were brought about. She listened attentively and seemed satisfied. Then I bade her adieu until tomorrow. The marriage was to be of the quiet kind. I found that Mrs. Despard had made no arrangement for any friend to accompany her, so setting all rules of etiquette at defiance, I suggested that although the bridegroom's brother, I should call for her in the morning and conduct her to the church. To this she readily consent consented. Somehow that evening I did not carry away such a pleasing impression of my brother's bride as I did when I first met her. I can give no reason for this, except that I was not forgetful of my wife's accusation that when I first met Judith Despard, I had been carried away by the glamour of her beauty and thought of nothing else. As I walked to Claude's rooms, which I occupied for the night, I almost regretted that he had been so hasty. Certainly I wished that I knew more of his bride, but it was now too late for regrets or wishes. I called for Mrs. Despard at the appointed hour and found her quite ready to start. Her dress was plain and simple. I cannot describe it, but I saw that in spite of her excessive pallor, she looked very beautiful. In the carriage, on our way to the church, she was very silent, answering my remarks with monosyllables. I left her in peace, supposing that at such a moment every woman must be more or less agitated. When the carriage drew up at the church door, the bride laid her hand upon my arm. I could feel that she was trembling. Claude will be here, she asked. Nothing will stop him. Yes, Claude was in the church waiting for us. We exchanged greetings. The old sexton summoned the curate, and Judith Despard, my brother, and myself walked up to the altar rails. Claude looked very well that morning, a little fagged, perhaps. Uh, again, this is late 1800s, so that word had a very different context at the time. Uh, but the long night journey would account for that. He certainly looked proud and happy. And if you're curious about that context, it would be um, essentially saying he looked kind of disheveled and uh, thin, kind of like out of sorts. Um, uh, this would be similar in context to uh, the meaning of the word that means a bundle of sticks. So, sorry. Um, <laughs> He certainly looked proud and happy as he stood on the altar step by step by side, or uh, the altar step side by side with, his, with the woman who in a few minutes would be his wife. But before the curate had finished reading the opening address, a great change came over him. From where I was standing, I could see only his side face, but that was enough to show me that he was suffering from some agitation, something far above the nervousness so often displayed by a br bridegroom. A deadly pallor came over his face, small beads of perspiration sprang to his brow, and I noticed that those telltales of mental disturbance, the hands, were so tightly clinched that the knuckles grew white. It was evident that he was suffering anguish of some kind, and for a moment I thought of stopping the service. But the rite is but a short one, and from whatever cause Claude's agitation might proceed, it was perhaps better to trust to him to curb it for a few moments than to make a scene. Nevertheless, I watched him intently and anxiously. Then came the charge to declare any impediment. As the curate made the conventional pause, Claude 
To my surprise, glanced round in a startled way as if fearing that his marriage would at that last moment be forbidden. The look on his face was now one of actual terror. Both bride and bridegroom said their I wills in such low tones I could scarcely hear their voices. Then in pursuance of my duty, I gave the woman to the priest. He joined the hands of Claude and Judith. After having played my little part, I had not moved back to my former station. I was now close to the bride, and as Claude turned to her, could see his face to advantage. It was positively distorted with suppressed emotion of some kind. His mouth was set, and I could see that his teeth were closed on his upper lip. He did not look at his fair bride. His gaze passed over her shoulder. In fact, he seemed almost oblivious to her presence. I was dreadfully frightened. The clergyman's voice rang out, I, Claude, take thee, Judith, to my wedded wife. Then hearing an echo of his words, he paused. Repeat after me, he prompted. Again he began, I, Claude. But his voice was drowned in a louder one, which rang through the empty church. With a fierce cry and an inexpressible rage, Claude had thrown the bride's hand from him and was pointing and gesticulating toward the wall upon which his eyes were riveted. Here, even here! He almost shrieked, that cursed, white, wicked, dying face. Whose is it? Why does it come between me and my love? Mad, mad, I am going mad. I heeded not the clergyman's look of dismay or the bride's cry of distress. I thought of nothing but my unfortunate brother. Here at the moment, which should be the happiest, he had yet known the gruesome hallucination had come back to him. I threw my arm round him and tried to call him. It is fancy, dear boy, I said. In a moment it will be gone. Gone? Why does it come? What have I to do with this dying man? Look, Frank, look! Something tells me if you look, you will see it. There, there, look there! His eyes were ever fixed on the same point. He grasped my arm convulsively, and I am ashamed to say that I yielded and looked in the direction of his gaze. There is nothing there, I said smoothly. Look, he exclaimed, it will come to you as it me. It may have been the hope of convincing Claude of the illusion, illusionary nature of the sight which tormented him. It may have been some strange fascination wrought by his words and manner which made me for some moments gaze with him. God of heaven! I saw gradually forming out of the nothing, gathering on the blank wall in front of me, a face, or a semblance of a face, white, ghastly horrible. Long, dank, wet-looking, dark hair, eyes starting from their sockets, lips working. The whole appearance of that face of a man who is struggling with death in every detail as Claude had described it. And yet, to me, that face was more terrible than ever it could be to Claude. I gazed in horror. I felt my eyes growing riveted to the sight as, its own, as his own. I felt my whole frame trembling. I knew that in another moment I should be raving as wildly as he raved. Only his hoarse whisper recalled to me to my senses. You see, he asked, or rather asserted. Horror forced the truth from me. I see, or fancy I see, I answered. With a wild laugh, Claude broke from me. He rushed down the church and disappeared. As he left me, the face, thank heaven, faded from the wall or from my imagination. I turned to my companions. Judith Despard was lying in a dead swoon on the altar steps. The curate was, with trembling hands was loosening the throat of her dress. I called for water. The sexton brought it. I bathed the poor woman's temples, and in a few minutes she sighed opening her eyes, and then shuddered. I took her in my arms and staggered to the church door. The curate removed his surplice and followed me. I placed my almost senseless burden in, her ca in the carriage. For heaven's sake, see her home, I said to the curate. I must go and look after my brother. As soon as I have seen him, I will come round to Mrs. Desperd's. Get her home quickly. The coachman knows where to go. Uh... The brougham drove off. I threw myself into a cab and drove toward Claude's rooms. I hoped he might have gone straight there. To my great relief, when I reached his house, he was on the doorstep. We entered his room together. He sank wearily into a chair and buried his face in his hands. I was scarcely less agitated than himself, and my face, as I caught its reflection in the mirror, was as white as his own. I waited for him to speak. Presently, he raised his head. 
Go to her, he said. Ask her why that face comes between us. You saw it, even you. It can be no fancy of mine. Tell her we can meet no more. I will wait until you are calmer before I go. Calm? I am myself now. The thing has left me as it always does. Frank, I have hidden from you one peculiarity of my state. That awful face never shows itself to me unless I am in her company. Even at the altar it came between us. Go to her. Ask her why it comes. I left him but did not quit the house for some time. I went into an adjoining room and tried to collect my thoughts, for as I said, my mind was more troubled than even Claude's could be. I am ashamed to reassert it. I am willing to own that excitement, but my, my brother's impressive manner, superstition, what I did not know I possessed, anything that may bear a natural explanation, may have raised that vision. But why should that phantom, gathering and growing from nothing until it attained form, or at least semblance, have been the face of one I had known? Why should the features distorted in deadly agony have been those of my brother Stephen? For his was the dreadful face which Claude's prompting or, or my own imagination had raised. Almost like one in a dream, I went to do Claude's bidding. I was thankful upon reaching Mrs. Despard's to find that she had gone to her room and left word that she could see no one today. This gave me time to consider the position. Acting on a sudden impulse, I went to the telegraph office and sent instructions to my wife to forward to me by passenger train a small box in which I kept old letters and papers. Then I went back to Claude and, after some persuasion, induced him to leave town once more, or at once. I told him I would arrange everything on the morrow. He was better away. In the morning, my box arrived. In it, I found what I wanted. After the calming, calming effects of a night's rest, I felt ashamed of my weakness as I drew from old letters a photograph of my brother Stephen, one taken about two years before the report of his death reached, reached us. Nevertheless, I put the portrait in my pocket and about noon went to, went to Mrs. Despert's. <clears throat> I was at once admitted, and in a few minutes she came to me. She looked worn and haggard, as if sleep had not visited her for nights. Dark circles had formed round her fine eyes. Lines seemed to have deepened round her firm, passionate mouth. She advanced eagerly toward me and held out her hand. I took it in silence. Indeed, I scarcely knew what to say or how to act. Where is Claude? she asked in a quick voice, but scarcely above a whisper. He has left town for a few days. She pressed her hand to her heart. Does that mean I shall see him no more? I am afraid I must say it does. He thinks it better you should part. She gave a sharp cry and walked up and down the room, wringing her hands. Her lips moved rapidly, and I knew she was muttering many words, but in so low a key I could not catch their meaning. Suddenly she stopped and turned upon me fiercely. Is this by your counsel and advice? she demanded. No. It is his own unbiased decision. Why? Tell me why. He loved me. I love him. Why does he leave me? The passionate entreaty of her voice is indescribable. What could I say to her? Words stuck in my throat. It seemed the height of absurdity for a sane man to give a sane woman the true reason for Claude's broken faith. I stammered out something about his bad state of health. If he is ill, I will nurse him, she cried. I will wait for years if he will give me hope. Dr. Morton, I love Claude, and I never before loved a man, or as I never before loved a man. She clasped her hands and looked imploringly into my face. In a mechanical way, I drew the portrait of my dead brother from my breast. She saw the action. His likeness, she cried joyfully. He sends it to me. Ah, oh, he loves me. I handed her the photograph. Mrs. Despard, I asked, do you know... I did not finish the question, yet it was fully answered. Never, I believe, save then did, I, did a human face undergo such a sudden, frightful change. The woman's very lips grew ashen, her eyes glared into mine, and I saw them full of dread. She staggered, all but fell. Why is it here? Who is it? She gasped out. I was a I was a prey to the wildest excitement. To what revelation was this trending? What awful thing had I to learn? Listen, I said sternly. Woman, it is for you to answer the question. Is this the face of the man, his dying face, that comes between you and your lover? 
Tell me his name, I read rather than heard the words from her dry, uh, her dry lips formed. The name he was once known by was Stanley. A quick, sharp shudder ran through her. For a moment, I thought she was going to faint. He is dead, she said. Why does he come between me and my love? Others have loved or said they loved me since then. They saw no dread faces. Had I loved them, I might have married and been happy. Claude, I love. Why does the dead man trouble him? That man, I replied, was my brother, Claude's brother. She threw out her arms with a gesture of utter despair. Your brother, Claude's brother, she repeated. Then, her, then she fixed her eyes on mine as if she would read the secrets of my soul. You are lying, she said. I am not. He was our eldest brother. He left England years ago. He passed under a false name. He died. When and how did he die? She sank a dead weight into a chair, but still she looked at me like one under a spell. I seized her wrist. Tell me, woman, I cried. Tell me what this man was to you. Why his dying face comes to us. The truth. Speak the truth. She seemed to cower beneath my words, but her eyes were still on my face. Speak, I cried fiercely, and ten, ten, uh, tightening my grasp upon her wrist. As At last she found words. He was my husband. I killed him, she said in a strange voice low yet perfectly distinct. <clears throat> I recoiled in horror. This woman, the widow and self-confessed murderess of one brother, within an ace of being the wife of the other. You murdered him, I said, turning to the woman. I murdered him. He made my life a hell upon earth. He beat me, cursed me, ruined me. He was the foulest hearted fiend that ever lived. I killed him. No remorse, no regret in her words, quite overcome. I leaned, quite overcome, I leaned against the chimney piece. Bad as I knew Stephen Morton to have been, I could at that moment only think of him as a gay, light-hearted schoolboy, my elder brother, and in those days a perfect hero in my eyes. No wonder my heart was full of vengeance, yet even in the first flush of my rage I knew that I could do nothing. No human justice could be meted out to this woman. There was nothing to prove the truth of her self-accusation. She would escape scot-free. Would that I could avenge his death, I said suddenly. She sprang to her feet, her dark eyes ablaze. Avenged, she cried. Is it not doubly, trebly avenged? <clears throat> he has not taken all I care for in life from me. Has he not taken my love from my side? Coward in life, coward in death. When I killed him, I knew he would try to come back to me. He has tried for years. Oh, I was too strong for him. I could banish the face with which he strove to haunt me. I could forget. I could love. I could, ha I could have been happy. Yet he has conquered at last. Not me. He could not conquer me, but the one I love. Oh, the coward is avenged. In spite of my feeling of abhorrence, I gazed on the speaker in amazement. Her words were not those of one who had committed a black crime, but of one who had suffered wrong. The strange, fanciful idea that the dead man had been trying to haunt her, but had been kept at bay by her strong will, was in my experience unprecedented. As I saw the agony of mind under which she was laboring, the thought came to me that perhaps her words were true, that my brother's death was this day avenged. I resolved to leave her. I could gain no good by prolonging the painful scene. She was still pacing the room in fierce passion. Suddenly she stopped short and in thrilling accents began to speak. It seemed as if she had forgotten my presence. See, she cried, the riverbank, the dark rushing stream. Ah, we are all alone side by side, far away from everyone. Fool, if, if you could read my heart, would you walk so near to the giddy bank brink? Do you think the memory of the old love will stay my hand when the chance comes? Old love is dead, you beat it, cursed it to death. How fast does that stream run? Can a strong man swim against it? Oh, if I could be sure, sure that one push would end it all and give me freedom. Once I longed for love, your love. Now I long for death, your death. Oh, brave swift tide, are you strong enough to free me forever? Hark, I can hear the roar of the rapids in the distance. There is a deep fall from the river cliff. There are rocks. Fool, you stand at the very edge and look down. The moment has come. 
With her last exclamation, she used a violent gesture as if pushing something fiercely from her. She was, I knew in her excitement, reenacting the tragedy. With her last exclamation, oh, sorry, free, 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 she cried with a delirious, almost rapturous laugh and clasped her hands. Hold him, brave stream, sweep him away. See, he swims, but he dare not swim with you. You are hurrying down to the rapids. He must face you and wrestle with you for his life. Bear him down, keep him from me. If he masters you, he will land and kill me. Hold him fast, brave stream. <sighs> His strength fails. He is swept away. He is under. No, no, I see him again. He turns his face to me. He knows I did it. With his last breath, he is cursing me. His last breath is gone. Gone forever. I am free. The changes in her voice, ranging from dread to tearful joy, her passionate words, her eloquent gestures, all these combined to bring the very scene before my eyes. I stood spellbound, and even as she described it, seemed to see the unfortunate man battling for dear life in the rushing stream, growing every moment weaker and weaker. As the woman's last wild exclamation, gone forever, I am free, rang from the room, I seemed to hear the cry of despair drowned as the waves closed over the wretched man's head. I knew every detail of my brother's fate. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I need a sip of water. I turned to leave the room. I longed to get away, and if possible to banish the events of the day from my mind. It was not given to me to be Stephen Morton's avenger. My hand was on the door when the woman sprang to my side. She grasped my arm and drew me back into the room. Look, she whispered, do you see it? There, the face, that awful face. It has come at last to me. The dead man has conquered. There, look, his eyes glaring, his mouth mocking. Now it has once come, I shall see it always, always. Look. No, I was not doomed again to see or to fancy I saw that face. Its mission, so far as I was concerned, was at an end. But the look of con uh, concentrated horror which Judith Despard cast at the wall of the room beggar's description. Then, with a piteous cry, she fell at my feet and seemed to strive to make me shield her from something she dreaded. I raised her. She broke from my grasp and again fell upon the floor this time in paroxysms of madness. My tale is ended. That night she was removed to a private lunatic asylum, where for three years she was kept at my expense. She died raving mad from inquiries, and from inquiries I made from that, <clears throat> and from inquiries I made, I know that from the moment when it first appeared to her to the hour of her death, the face of the man she had killed was ever with Judith Despard. Well, so that was uh, A Dead Man's Face, A Ghost Story by Hugh Conway, published in this book in 1885. Whew. It was a bit longer than I was anticipating, uh, but we got through it during stream. Uh, I didn't even run over, which is amazing. Uh, Scruff, thank you for complimenting me as a narrator. I do my best. That was a sight read. Like, if I was actually, like, going to narrate it for, like, recording or something like that, I would want to have at least... I, I would probably want to do it in sections uh, so that I could practice. But um, <laughs> I'm trying my best at sight reading. Uh, I'm going to just pull a poet random maybe, to end the stream with. <laughs> oh, Crafty Becky, thank you. And, and Millie Glitch, thank you. I don't know Poe. I'm going to check and see how long this is. I, I want... Let's see. I know some Poe. I don't know lots of Poe. And I don't want one that's too long. <clears throat> how about Eleonora? Does anybody know Eleonora? 
I thought that was a good ghost story. I've never read that author before, but um, for the 1880s, that was that was a good ghost story. It's not like super haunting, but I, I thought it was good. <clears throat> So now I'm going to look at, uh, this is Edgar Allan Poe. Sorry, there's a embossed watermark in these pages, which is, I don't think you'll be able to make it out. Um, it's here on the side. I can't tell what it says. But uh, this is a 10-page story by Poe. <clears throat> Sub concert. Uh, Sub conservatione forme specifice salva anima, Raymond Lully. Uh, if someone wants to translate that, feel free. My Latin is way rusty, and I'm not even really getting a, a full sense of the sentence. I am come of a race noted for vigor of fancy and ardor of passion. Men have called me mad, but the question is not yet settled whether madness is or is not the loftiest intelligence. Whether much that is glorious, whether all that is profound does not spring from disease of thought, from moods of mind exalted at the expense of the general intellect. They who dream by day are cognizant of many things which escape those who dream only by night. In their gray visions, they obtain glimpses of eternity and thrill in waking to find that they have been upon the verge of the great secret. In snatches, they learn something of the wisdom which is of good and more of the mere knowledge which is of evil. They penetrate, however, rudderless or compassless into the vast ocean of the light ineffable. And again, like the adventures of the Nubian ge geographer, Agressi sunt mare tenebro, teneb, tenebrarum quid in eo esset exploraturi. We will say then that I am mad. I grant at least that there are two distinct conditions of my mental existence. The condition of a lucid reason, not to be disputed, and belonging to the memory of events forming the first epoch of my life and a condition of shadow and doubt appertaining to the present and to the recollection of what constitutes the second great era of my being. Therefore, what I shall tell of the earlier period believe, and to what I may relate of the later time give only such credit as may seem due, or doubt it altogether. Or if doubt, or if doubt it ye cannot, then play unto its riddle the Oedipus. She whom I loved in youth, and of whom I now pen calmly and distinctly these remembrances, was the sole daughter of the only sister of my mother, long departed. Eleonora was the name of my cousin. We had always dwelled together beneath the tropical sun in the valley of the many-colored grass. No unguided footstep ever came upon that vale, for it lay far away among, up among the range of giant hills that hung beetling around about it, Shutting out the sun, uh, <clears throat> shutting out the sunlight from its sweetest recesses, no path was trodden in its vicinity, and to reach our happy home, there was need of putting back with force the foliage of many thousands of forest trees and of crushing to death the glories of many millions of fragrant flowers. Thus it was that we lived all alone, knowing nothing of the world without the valley, I and my cousin and her mother. From the dim regions beyond the mountains, at the upper end of our encircled domain, there crept out a narrow and deep river, brighter than all save the eyes of Eleonora. And winding stealthily about in mazy courses, it passed away at length through a shadowy gorge among hills still dimmer than those whence it had issued. We called it the River of Silence, for there seemed to be a hushing influence in its flow. No murmur arose from its bed, and so gently it wandered along that the pearly pebbles upon which we loved to gaze far down within its bosom stirred not at all, but lay in a motionless content, yet in its own old station shining on gloriously forever. 
The margin of the river and of the many dazzling rivulets that glided through devious ways into its channel, as well as the spaces that extended from the margins away down into the depths of the streams until they reached the bed of pebbles at the bottom. These spots, not less than the whole surface of the valley from the river to the mountains that girdled it in, were carpeted all by a soft green grass, thick, short, perfectly even, and vanilla perfumed, but so besprinkled throughout with the yellow buttercup, the white daisy, the purple violet, and the ruby red asphodel, that, it exceeding, that its exceeding beauty spoke to our hearts in loud tones of the love and of the glory of God. There's an illustration in here. Eleonora, we waited in the river of silence for there seemed to be a hushing influence in its flow. And you should see the bottom of the illustration. Uh, death appears to be in the uh, reflection in the water. And here and there in groves about this grass, like wildernesses of dreams sprang up fantastic trees whose tall slender stems stood not upright but slanted gracefully toward the light that peered at noonday into the center of the valley. Their bark was speckled with the vivid, alternative, or the vivid alternate splendor of ebony and silver and was smoother than all save the cheeks of Eleonora. So that but for the brilliant green of the huge leaves that spread from their summits in long, tremulous lines dallying with the zephyrs, one might have fancied them giant serpents of Syria doing homage to their sovereign, the sun. Hand in hand about this valley for fifteen years I ro roamed I with Eleonora before love entered within our hearts. It was one evening at the close of the third lustrum of her life and of the fourth of my own that we sat locked in each other's embrace beneath the serpent-like trees and looked down within the waters of the river of silence at our images therein. We spoke no words during the rest of that sweet day, and our words, even upon the morrow, were tremulous and few. We had drawn the god Eros from that wave, and now we felt that we had enkindled within us the fiery souls of our forefathers, the passions which had for centuries distinguished our race came thronging with the fancies for which they had been equally noted, and together breathed a delirious bliss over the valley of the many-colored grass. A change fell upon all things. Strange, brilliant flowers, star-shaped, burst out upon the trees where no flowers had been known before. The tints of the green carpet deepened, and when, one by one, the white daisies shrank away, there sprang up, in place of them, ten by ten of the ruby-red asphodel. And life arose in our paths, for the tall flamingo, hitherto unseen, with all gay glowing birds, flaunted his scarlet plumage before us. The golden and silver fish haunted the river, out of the bosom of which issued, little by little, a murmur that swelled, at length, into a lulling melody more divine than that of the harp of Aeolus, uh, sweeter than all save the voice of Eleonora. And now, too, a voluminous cloud, which we had long watched in the regions of Hesper, floated out thence, all gorgeous in crimson and gold, and settling in peace above us, sank day by day, lower and lower, until its edges rested upon the tops of the mountains, turning all their dimness into magnificence, and shutting us up, as if forever, within a magic prison house of grandeur and glory. The loveliness of Eleonora was that of the seraphim, but she was a maiden, artless and innocent, as the brief life she had led among the flowers. No guile disguised the fervor of love which animated her heart, and she examined with me its inmost recesses as we walked together in the valley of the many-colored grass, and discoursed of the mighty changes which had lately taken place therein. At length, having, spoke, having spoken one day in tears of the last sad change which must befall humanity, she thenceforward dwelt only upon this one sorrowful theme, interweaving it into all of our, all our converse, as in the songs of the bard of uh, Skiraz. The same images are found occurring again and again in every impressive variation of phase. She had seen that the finger of death was upon her bosom, that like the ephemeron, she had been made perfect in loveliness only to die. 
but the terrors of the grave to her lay solely in a consideration which she revealed to me one evening at twilight by the banks of the river of silence. She grieved to think that having entombed her in the valley of the many-colored grass, I would quit forever its happy recesses, transferring the love which now was so passionately her own to some maiden of the outer and everyday world. And then and there I threw myself hurriedly at the feet of Eleonora and offered up a vow to herself and to heaven, that I would never bind myself in marriage to any daughter of earth, that I would in no manner prove recreant of her dear memory, or to the memory of the devout affection with which she had blessed me. And I called the mighty ruler of the universe to witness the pious solemnity of my vow, and the curse which I invoked of him and of her, a saint in hallusion, should I prove traitorous to that promise involved a penalty of the exceeding great horror of which I will not permit of which will not permit me to make record of it here and the bright eyes of Eleonora grew brighter at my words and she sighed as if a deadly burden had been taken from her breast and she trembled and very bitterly wept but she made acceptance of the vow for what was she but a child and it made easy to her the bed of her death and she said to me not many days afterward Trank tranquilly dying, that because of what I had done for the comfort of her spirit, she would watch over me in that spirit when departed, and if so, it were permitted her, return to me visibly in the watches of the night. But if this thing were indeed beyond the power of the souls in paradise, that she would at least give me frequent indications of her presence, sighing upon me in the evening winds, or filling the air which I breathed with perfume from the censers of the angels. And with these words upon her lips, she yielded up her innocent life, putting to an end to the first epoch of my own. Thus far I have faithfully said, but as I pass the barrier in time's path, formed by the death of my beloved, and proceed with the second era of my existence, I feel that a shadow gathers over my brain, and I mistrust my perfect sanity of the record. But let me on. Years dragged themselves along heavily. And still I dwelled within the valley of many-colored grass, but a second change had come upon all things. The star-shaped flowers shrank into the stems of the trees and appeared no more. The tints of the green carpet faded, and one by one the ruby-red asphodels withered away, and there sprang up, in place of them, ten by ten, dark, eye-like violets that writhed uneasily and were ever encumbered with dew, and life departed from our paths, for the tall flamingo flaunted no, no longer his scarlet plumage before us, but flew sadly from the vale into the hills with all the gay glowing birds that had arrived in his company. And the golden and silver fish swam down through the gorge at the lower end of our dom domain and bedecked the sweet river never again. And the lulling melody that had been softer than the wind harp of Aeolus and more divine than all save the voice of Eleonora, it died little by little away in murmurs growing lower and lower until the stream returned at length utterly into the solemnity of its original silence. And then, lastly, the voluminous cloud uprose and abandoning the tops of the mountains of the, to the dimness of old fell back into the regions of Hesper and took away all its manifold golden and gorgeous glories from the valley of the many-colored grass. Yet the promises of Eleonora were not forgotten. For I heard the sounds of the swinging in the censers of the angels, and streams of a holy perfume floated ever and ever about the valley. And at lone hours, when my heart beat heavily, and winds that bathed my brow came upon me laden with soft sighs, and indistinct murmurs filled off in the night air, and once, oh, but only once, I was awakened from a slumber like the slumber of death by the pressing of spiritual lips upon my own. But the void within my heart refused, even thus, to be filled. I longed for the love which had before filled it to overflowing. At length the valley pained me through its memories of Eleonora, and I left it forever for the vanities and turbulent triumphs of the world. I found myself within a strange city, where all things might have served to blot from recollection the sweet dreams I had dreamed so long in the valley of many-colored grass the pomps and pageantries of a stately court and the mad clangor of arms and the radiant loveliness of women bewildered and intoxicated my brain. But as yet my soul had proved true to its vows and the indications of the presence of Eleonora were still given me in the silent hours of the night. 
Suddenly these manifestations, they ceased, and the world grew dark before mine eyes, and I stood aghast at the burning thoughts which possessed, at the terrible temptations which beset me. For there came from some far, far distant and unknown land, known land into the gay court of the king I served, a maiden whose beauty, a maiden to whose beauty my whole recreant heart yielded at once, at whose footstool I bowed down with a struggle in the most ardent, in the most abject worship of love. What indeed was my passion for the young girl of the valley in comparison with the fervor and the delirium of the spirit lifting ecstasy of adoration with which I poured out my whole soul in tears at the feet of the ethereal Ermengarde? How oh, bright was the seraph Ermengarde! And in the knowledge I had room for, an, and in that knowledge I had room for none other. O oh, divine was the angel Ermengarde. And as I looked down into the depths of her memorial eyes, I thought only of them and of her. I wedded, nor dreaded the curse I had invoked, and in bitterness was not visited. In its bitterness was not visited upon me, and once, but once again, in the silence of the night, there came through my lattice the soft sighs which had forsaken me, and they mo mo and they modeled themselves into familiar and sweet voice, saying, "Sleep in peace, for the spirit of love reigneth and ruleth, and in taking to thy passionate heart her who is Ermengarde, thou art absolved for reasons which shall be made known to thee in heaven of thy vows unto Eleonora." That was one I was not familiar with. And a little bit less dark than the last one that we read by the other author. <clears throat> According to a translation I found, sub conservatoni uh, forme specify, specif I can't pronounce things at the moment. I've read too many things today. Specify, uh, salva. The soul is saved through preservation of a specific form. Raymond Lilly was a medieval philosopher, theologian, missionary, poet. From around 1234 to 1315, apparently he was stoned to death by Muslims he was trying to convert. <laughs> oh, geez. Thank you, uh, Hannah, for providing that information. That did take us beyond the end of our normal stream time, um, but that's okay. Um, I am going to switch us over now to face cam just so that I can say goodbyes and find someone to raid. Um, I hope that this was fun. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming and listening to me read some stories. Um, I will be live again next Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. for another Archival Adventures where I will be continuing with some spooky themed stuff. Um, I may look for that sanitarium collection. I will keep the Edgar Allan Poe on hand and maybe we can read some of the shorter works from Poe um, at the beginning and end of the stream. Uh, I think those sound like good ideas. I also plan at some point later this month to read um, or to share some of our collections with human hair in them and uh, maybe some of the Halloween cookbook things that we have. Um, those all sound like fun things to do. Let me see who we're going to raid today. Um, do, 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 do. Could go to the aquarium like we normally do. So how about we do that? Uh, I looks like they have jellyfish, uh, but it's a good chill out kind of stream for the afternoon, for the end of the day. Um, and I like supporting the aquarium. I'm not sure it's jellyfish. It may just be seagrasses. Um, <clears throat> no, it looks like it's just fish and seagrasses. So no jellyfish for anyone who's concerned about that. Um, but yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Uh, I hope to see you again for a future archival adventures. And um, yeah. Uh, Oh, I don't know, Key Squid. That'd be cool if they do a special on Vampire Squid for Halloween. Um, 
But that is going to be it for today. I hope that I see you again in the future. As I said, um, I will be doing more spooky things for the rest of the month. And I look forward to seeing you then. Until then, bye. <laughs>